Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Drew Renolette, the Director of Student Ministries here at Cal Prairie. I hope that you all had an amazing week. As we are getting ready to go into this week, I want to just come here and give you some announcements. I am currently right now, you can see this video, we are outside of Cal Prairie, but me personally, I am at Rainbow Trail Lutheran Camp in Hillside, Colorado. Uh, currently, we have 13 middle schoolers up here. Um, so if you could pray for us this week, it's going to be a great week. It's going to be a great time. Our second announcement is, as a lot of you know, we are taking a mission trip, a high school mission trip, to South Texas. We're going to a place called Far Texas, working with Border Perspectives. But the reason I bring that up is because on June 19th, we are having a car wash to help raise money for transportation and any fun events or anything like that we want to do on the way. So, if you want to come support the mission trip, support our high schoolers, come have that opportunity. That'll be June 19th from 10 to noon. So come support us. It's a $5 suggested donation per car, but it'll be a good time. Also, that same weekend on June 20th, it is Confirmation Sunday. We've had nine amazing students come and just want to confirm their faith, want to have that moment. and it's the end of the class, and that is the Sunday. We want to let them say what they've learned, want them to say what they've done, and we just want to welcome you and invite you to come join us that Sunday as we celebrate them. Just remember, also, we'd like you to check in by going to callprairie.info this morning just to let us know that you are here and that you have joined us this morning so we can catch up with you and just know who is here joining us. Oh, hey, Capri. Just finishing up a run here. And we're going to get to communion here in just a second. But first, I want to invite you to be a part of something, something pretty incredible. As many of you know, for the last five years, Cobb Prairie has been a part of Team World Vision here in Kansas City. And what we are, we're a group of runners and walkers who either do the Kansas City Half Marathon or a marathon to raise money for clean water in Africa. And it's been an incredible experience. We've had so many from our church do it, and I wanna invite you to do it with us. Now, I know I lost some of you the moment I said the word run, and I get it. You might think I'm not a runner, I'm not in shape, quarantine hit me hard, I completely understand. But here's what I love about our team. We're not the fastest team. We're not the strongest team, but we're a team of people who decided to, to run or walk for something bigger than ourselves. And that's what makes us special. And we've had people who've never done anything like this before join the team and they've done it, they've completed it. And I believe you could too, all while raising money for an amazing cause and changing lives in the process. And so here's what I wanna invite you to do. We're going to play a video here in just a second, and you're going to get a feel for what Team World Vision is. And then after the video, there's going to be a link that's going to pop up in the chat, and you can click that for more information, or you can text KCINFO to 44888. That's KCINFO to 44888, and you'll get more information. So check this out. Ubuntu is very important to us. It basically means I am because we are. We are all here united, moving our feet to make a difference in the world. We don't run for ourselves, but we run for more, right? I run for World Vision to raise money to help the Kids, they carry this 20 pounder, some water or miles, and uh, I do this running for them. It's unspeakable to think that a thousand children are dying every single day. It's not just my kids, it's not just somebody else's kids, it's our kids. I've seen moms who would do anything for their kids. 
they would, in essence, give up their entire life walking for water for their kids that even makes them sick. And it's something that's solvable. Having clean water allows the kids to be with their family, to be in school. It really is like it's changing whole communities because water is the basis for health in every way of life. There is something that you can do right now where you are and make a profound difference in somebody else's life. If you've never run before, World Vision has gotten thousands of people across the finish line. We have training plans that can get you from the couch to the course. And believe in yourself and believe that you are in capable hands with God and your community and that you can do this. Just do it. Uh, if I can do it. Just uh, do it, seriously. You can do it. You know, this whole thing started about four years ago. I quit smoking. I've had five knee surgeries. So it, this, is a, this is a total gift that God's given back to me. I need to do something with it. I mean, the idea of running a, even a half marathon at 60 years old was like, well, that's a crazy thing to do. When you get to that finish, you know, there's a group there, high fives and cowbells, and it's an awesome community. You might be thinking, I'm not a runner. I can't do this. You are not alone. You can conquer a marathon because we run together. And together, we can help end the global water crisis in our lifetime. You are because we are. Welcome back, guys. While you were watching that video, I went and got cleaned up, so I smell a little better now than I did before. But I really encourage you to check out that link in the chat or text KC Info to 44888. And last week in my sermon, I, I preached about Jesus, because we do that a lot. And one of the things that Jesus says in that story is that he is the living water. And I've always thought that was a really interesting title for him. But it, but it made more sense after I got to travel to Africa and see the communities being helped by Team World Vision. You know, there's a, a, a common saying, a phrase that they would use in their native tongue. And when translated, it means that water is life. Because in those communities, if you get clean water, it brings the whole community to life. And I think the people understood that when they heard Jesus call himself the living water because water is essential. And Jesus is the living water for us. He's the one that gives us life and keeps us going. And we remember that each week when we take communion. And that's what we're going to do now. So I encourage you at home to grab your, your bread or your cracker. And I encourage you to grab your wine or your juice and take it now because we're going to remember the moment that Jesus sat with his disciples when he took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you when he took the chalice and he held it up and he said this is my blood poured out for you this is the new covenant that we have and he told them to do this in remembrance of me and then he told them to pray most likely the prayer he had taught them to pray that I'm going to ask that you pray with me now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. So I want you to take the bread, I want you to take the wine, and as you eat and as you drink, I want you to think about how amazing it is that Jesus is our living water. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes 
to steal the joy I own. Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Yeah, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yeah. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Yeah, oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name yeah. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your everything you've got Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot Wouldn't you like to get away Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name And they're always glad you came You want to be where you can see Our troubles are Everybody knows your name You want to go where people know People are all the same You want to go where everybody knows your name Hey Caught Prairie, 10 years ago in Rolling Stone magazine, the Reader's Poll surveyed that this was the best theme song, television theme song of all time. And there you have it. So. I want to suggest to you that Caught Prairie's goal is to be like Cheers. I mean, or at least an 80s sitcom bar where everybody knows your name. Maybe online someday, if you guys would start putting your name in the chat box. Thanks to all those of you who do, a majority of you don't. No guilt, we love you, but just saying. Um, we want to be the kind of place where even if we don't know your name, you have the confidence that the love you feel in this room, in our hearts, between us that you would be willing to come to us and ask for help if you needed it and would be willing to volunteer to help a brother or sister in the church outside its doors in the world with the help of the church 
because you love Jesus and you can tell that the people around you here are your friends. This is the kind of church we want to be. I want you to imagine being a regular at Cheers or in any bar for 38 years. So you're a regular patron, you buy, you buy your drinks, you make friends, you play darts, you tell jokes, you swap trivia for 38 years. And yet nobody really cares enough about you that when you get hurt or sick or when you need something that the other people in the, in the room could give you, nobody volunteers. That's just not a bad episode of Cheers. That's just not a bad church story. That's a Bible story. In fact, I want you to look with me right now at John chapter 5 when we read about the healing at the Bethesda pool. So read with me John chapter 5, verse 1 and following. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of six sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches, waiting for a certain movement of, a wa of the water. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he or she had. Now one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew that he'd been ill for such a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? And the sick man said, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. What? <laughs> He's been there for 38 years? Probably every day? And he doesn't have any friends that are going to help him get in the water and heal him? I mean, even if they're not like super good friends, you'd think after a couple of years, some of them would come up with a plan, right? Like, okay, if the water like starts getting all movie on Monday, okay, then that's Jerry's turn. On Tuesday, Ermagard, right? I mean, they would have come up with something or maybe even something a little bit sketchy like, okay, uh, Jerry really needs this badly. So... If the water starts stirring, somebody create a commotion, like, you know, throw a rock over at the, at, at the temple door or say, look, there's a centurion water skiing. Or say something so that Jerry can get in the water. 38 years and nobody is there to help him get in the water. The point is, what kind of community lets a man suffer, be, be handicapped when he could have been healed all by himself, but probably even more important, what's in the heart of a man who has to say to a rabbi who asks him, I've been here 40 years and I don't have a single friend that cares enough to help. Or literally, I have no one. We're going to be looking today at this particular passage because I think it gives us both a warning and an invitation about what the church of Jesus Christ can be. And for those of us who are part of this local church, Caw Prairie, both here on campus and you guys digitally around the country and world, we want to challenge ourselves with God's word to God's church through this passage in John chapter 5. I'm glad you're joining us today. So here are some statistics about friendships in America. And this is from a survey. Actually, I think I got this off of a Fox News site. 45% um, of U.S. adults admit that it's difficult to make new friends and that the average American hasn't made a new friend in five years. Okay, time out. Ask yourself, have I made a new friend in five years? If you have made a new friend in five years, I want you to hit a heart button. And if you've tried or have given up, maybe put the surrender. Or maybe that's a praise. Chris, is that a praise button or a surrender? I don't know. Um, click that one. It would just be interesting to see. But here's some more stats. And, and why does it take us so long to make friends? Why is it so hard? Over 50%, according to the article, don't like going out to bars, which is where a lot of people find or hang out with friends. Um, they think, over 50% think everybody already has their friends. They don't really need a new one, so why should I try? 30%, approximately 30% have commitments with their family. Now I can get that, right? 
the family takes a lot of time and you've got work. Almost 30% say they don't have any hobbies that would help them meet new people. I'll tell you what, one of my hobbies is, is speaking German. Laura is so glad to get me out of the house and grateful that I'm going somewhere other than work. Right, so I go to a I go to a thing called a Stammtisch, <clears throat> kind of like a drinking club, um, but mostly it's for you know practicing German. So I, I picked that hobby up so that I would have a new place to make some new friends, and it's worked. I've met some great people. About 20% of the people who respond don't have new friends because they've moved to a new city. Wow, that's one out of five. And then 45% say they would go out of their way to make new friends if they only knew how or if they only had an opportunity. 30 years ago, uh, Roy Oldenburg wrote a book and um, it was called The Great Good Place. I wanna show that right here um, in the inlay that has profoundly influenced architecture and sociological thinking, public, commercial, sometimes church even. In that book, he coined a term called third place, the third place, meaning, so the first place is your home, the second place is your work or school, somewhere where you're, you have to go and, and you're dependent on that and where your time is pretty structured and where the expectations are pretty high. The third place is somewhere that's not your home, that's not your work or school, that you can go to relax, have fun, but also expand your mind and your social circle. As he described it, somewhere you can connect with others, share your thoughts and dreams, use your other gifts, feed your other passions, and have fun. So Oldenburg described eight characteristics. Now eight points of anything is a lot to put in a sermon, but I'm gonna ask you to follow me through this because I think this is important. And I think number one, it's interesting. And number two, you might ask yourself, what places, what, what locations and what groups of people constitute a third place in my life. And of course, in the sermon role here, how many of these attributes apply to your church? For many of you, for most of you, that's probably our church, Caw Prairie Community Church. How much is our church a third place? So here are the, here are the eight principles. Number one, it's neutral ground. People go there because they wanna be there. They're not forced to be there and they can come and go as they please. There's no penalty. There's no financial, political, legal, or or, or social obligations. Now you can, you can like people do, you can voluntarily take on obligations. That, that's what a, what a pledge is, a financial pledge. Those of us who wanna disciple ourselves, we voluntarily do that. But there's no, there's no entry fee, right? And uh, even if you're gone for days or weeks and you come back, people are gonna be just as happy to see you when you come back as they were the day before you left. You don't have to give an accounting for where you work. Now, somebody that's nosy and extroverted like me, I'm probably gonna ask you, <laughs> but you can just smile and say, Dan, I'm just glad to be back. And I will know that's the clue to not, not ask you any more questions, right? So it's, it's neutral ground. Number two, it's an inclusive place. People from all walks of life are welcome. And it, we try to be really unpretentious. People that might have a lot of money, don't show it off or act like it. People that, people that don't have so much going on, they know they're just as loved and welcomed. If you have kids that are model citizens and you know model UN ambassadors, we're happy for you and God love them. We'll, we'll, they'll be welcome in the youth group. But if you have kids that are you know kind of on the outs and struggling with life, they're welcome too and we love you just as much. There's no expectations about status or behavior. We're an inclusive place. So much so that we don't wanna leave anybody on the outside looking in. Number three, conversation is the focus. Okay, this may not apply totally to church because conversation with each other is important and that's the, that's the kind of tie-in to today's sermon series, to this month's sermon series, Church in the Lobby. But our, but our main focus isn't this lateral, horizontal reach to our, our neighbors and friends. It's our vertical worship of Almighty God. So this may be not, maybe not fit the best, but there are times in the life of a church when this applies. Um, Oldenburg said this is a place where playful conversation is the primary activity. This is where the tone is good natured and lively. The conversation is likely stimulating and engaging. And it's a place where humor and wit run freely and people are open to sharing their ideas and dreams. Okay, time out. Chris is in the room here filming with me. Chris, I gotta tell you this. One of the counselors from JCPRD said she told her parents that I was a funny pastor. I'm like, wow. And you haven't even met Chris. So just want to <clears throat> say that out there to digital land. Apparently I qualify as a funny pastor. So maybe that's third place. Anyway, number four, they are accessible and accommodating. 
you can come here. We, uh, we have handicap parking, uh, we have handicap accessibility, uh, but more importantly, it means the, the spiritual and emotional. You're welcome here, this, whatever your junk is. In fact, if you don't think you have any junk, it's gonna be awkward to meet you because the rest of us know we have our own. It's a place where you are welcome regardless of the situation you come from, the assets you have, the, the, the types of talents you have, and I like this, they often have free or inexpensive food or drink to accompany good conversation. Well, we definitely try to have that. Number five, there are regulars, a host of regulars that habitually return there, import, who are an important part of the mood and atmosphere setters for the place. Um, it should be an easy to, it should be a place where it's easy to find a familiar face and we're also open to newcomers. And where regulars are also there to help new people feel welcomed and encouraged. Okay, I think that summarizes a pretty darn healthy church. And like if you're a, if you're a regular at Caw Prairie, whether it's in person or online here, just do me a favor here in the chat box. Maybe, uh, maybe put the hand raise up like woohoo. And uh, if you've been greeted or loved on or cared for or prayed for by a quote regular, would you press the heart button? I know that even as one of the pastors of the church, when I come on a Sunday morning and, and, I, and a friend asks me how I'm doing or someone says, you know, I've heard about something in your life. Can I pray with you? Oh, wow. Wow. I am grateful for the regulars who know me well enough that they're willing to do that. And my friends, especially here online, the more you share in the chat box, the more we get to know you and the more others get to know you and the easier it is and the more able we are to pray for you. Number six, they keep a low profile. This is speaking of the third place. It says, third places are wholesome and homely. Okay, well, all right, maybe, maybe the pastors are wholesome and homely. I mean, just speaking for myself, Chris. Um, but, but we're in Lenexa, kind of, a, kind of a trying to be a little bit more Leewood, which is a really expensive suburb. Um, I will tell you, our trash bin has um, a landscape facade on the on the bin of rough hewn sandstone limestone and uh, prairie grasses so it's a pretty handsome looking dumpster compound i would challenge any other church to out handsome our dumpster container but other than that we're a pretty unpretentious church and uh, that was only done because they required that for the zoning. All right, um, number seven, it has a playful atmosphere, a spirited mood, no tension or animosity like you sometimes would have at home and a lot of times might have at work. Instead, you'll find je laughter, joyful conversation and witty banter. And then finally, it's a home away from home. A third place has the same feelings of warmth and belonging like you'd find in your own home. Safe and steady, you might, you're gonna leave feel regenerated, you have a sense of ownership and you just feel glad to be there. Now that might be harder to feel like here in this digital environment, but I gotta tell you, Chris and I and all of our team, we pray for those of you who come to worship in this format. We pray for the names that we see on the chat box printout. We pray for you and we know that we're, we're, you are praying for one another. We rejoice to know when you press the, the pray button and you get a prayer partner to, to talk with you, we are grateful that you are part of this kind of digital third place that we've been attempting to build since the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 and that we continue to, to pour our hearts into. And we're grateful that you continue to, to say, yes, you want to be a part of this place. So anyway, the question is, do you need a third place? Um, I believe foundationally that everybody needs a church, right? The local church is the hope of the world. Is, is one of my favorite kind of modern church sayings. I think that's completely true. I mean, better politicians, better leaders, better laws are all good, but nothing's gonna change the world like hearts that are changed by the love and grace of Jesus Christ and sent on a purpose-filled mission like Christ does with us. So yes, the local church is the hope of the world. We are the necessity, but secular third places, more like Oldenburg was writing about, I don't know that all of us need them, but I think most of us do. And I bet all of us need them at least at some times. I mean, maybe if you're on a baseball team that socializes together, or you go on hunting trips regularly with friends and you, you socialize together, if you have a weekly bonfire on your cul-de-sac or down the block, if you volunteer at a nonprofit or, or you're part of a serving team here at church, you might already have that third place itch already scratched. In fact, you know, by the, when I was in seminary, 
So I had to, my first year, before Laura and I got married, Laura and I got married, um, I, I held on three different jobs. Um, some more successfully than others. I ended the year with one job. <laughs> but, um, so I was working hard, I didn't have a lot of time, um, but I had, a, I had a teaching job in a Polish neighborhood, an African American neighborhood, and a multiracial neighborhood. Well, that was senior year. Um, I had an assistant pastor role in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, and in my final year, I taught a, I taught a German, uh, I gave um, sermons at a German immigrant church on the north side. I was in all sorts of varied surroundings, all sorts of places. But my third place there was the student-run underground bar. Now, I call it a bar because there was like a small fridge with beers in it. But, but mostly it was a place where people grew together, where they could talk and laugh and argue and complain because, right, they were all students, right? What else do students like to do but kind of complain about the teachers? Um, but it was this beautiful, well, not beautiful, it kind of smelled. It was in a basement. Um, but it was an unregulated and unlicensed but but authentic and transparently real place where students and sometimes students and spouses could go to, to play and laugh and support and sometimes even a worship service would break out. The problem was we couldn't invite outsiders in or else the liquor department would find out, I think, and then the whole thing would get shut down. So it wasn't very evangelical. But other than that, it was a beautiful third place. You know, which, which forces the question, can a church or should a church be one of those places? I mean, without the damp, moldy smell or the, or the politics and all, can a church be the kind of place where everybody knows your name? And if they don't, they're going to love you so much that you would wish they did. Well, I think the answer is yes. I want to show you some pictures right now of the church in the lobby that happened last Sunday and over these last couple weeks um, that Pastor Chris was talking about. Take a look. So, so things have been amazing here these last couple weeks, and it really does feel like not only is, is church happening, not just vertically in the worship room, but, but horizontally here in the lobby, but what about us online? What about the community that we're building here? And, and I just want to say again, thank you for being part of it. You know, our numbers, since we returned in person, have, have dropped a little bit in uh, online, but not very much. I mean, you guys are watching on the soccer field sidelines. You're, you're looking, you're watching in your kitchen table while your teenagers are sleeping in. So a lot of you are watching this on demand later on YouTube or Facebook, and you don't even know if anybody's online at the same time. So the question is, how does this feel like a community if you're consuming it in such individual type of ways? Well, I think Pastor Chris kind of poked into that last week when he asked, what are the lobbies in your life? What are the places where you can make an impact in the places that you are, not just on a Sunday morning, but all throughout your life? Do you have a place, or a third place, as it were, where, where people don't just know your name, but they know your needs? And if they know your needs, they care about your needs. And they don't just care about your needs, they're willing to, they're willing to break a sweat change their calendar to help carry you to whatever water is going to be stirred so that God can meet your needs. And if you need a third place and don't have one, I want to challenge you to consider being a third place maker yourself. I mean, my mom used to tell me, don't just, don't just look for friends, Dan, you've got to be a friend. And so it's like, don't just look for a third place church, be a third place. Somewhere where the strangers are welcomed, where the lonely find friends, where the guilty find grace, where the ashamed find acceptance, and where the people who don't yet know Jesus are so excited by the fiery passion and faith we have that they're just dying to know how they can do it too and join us in changing lives with Jesus' love. So maybe you attend a church that doesn't feel super third placey, it doesn't feel super safe, Maybe you know there's people on the outside looking in and as much as you wish they were welcome, doesn't feel like everybody in the church really wants them. Well, the challenge is you be the third place. There's so much going on in a church. I can tell you as one of the pastors, we can't keep track of everything. Not everything that we do and say kind of directs the culture. The culture kind of has an independence of it on the, the culture in a church 
is based on the attitudes and hearts of the people who worship there, who, who raise their hand to serve there. And that could be you. If you're in a church that doesn't welcome people like a third place would, the question is, is God calling you to make your church home a, a third place where he is in the first place? So I've spent the first part of this, first two-thirds part <laughs> of the sermon talking about the community as a third place, right? We're a part of a community, a third place, a church. I've talked about the activity that we need to do as being the friend so that other people can find friends. But as we go back to the story, I think we'll, we'll find it interesting that it's not all about the Solomon, I'm sorry, it's not all about the Bethesda pool community. It's not all about what's wrong with all the, the, the handicapped man's friends. There is some insight into what might be a little bit wrong with the handicapped guy himself. So, I am going to suggest to you that this man, for as underserved by his community as he was, may also have played a role in his isolation himself. So, listen to the rest of it. We'll, we'll start here. This miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Well, that's a whole other sermon, right? But, but he replied, well, the man who healed me told me to pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. Here we go. But afterward, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, Now you are will, well, so stop sinning, or something even worse could happen to you. What's up with that? Well, remember, Jesus knew what the man's handicap was, right? But instead of just healing him uninvited, he asked the dude, Would you like to get well? Right? He didn't presume. And then the man said, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. It's almost like Jesus asked about the man's life's desire. What do you want to have happen? Do you want the next 38 years of your life to be different than the last 38 years were? And instead of giving him an answer about his life's desire, he gave Jesus an answer about his life's limitations. He said, I can't get better because nobody will help me. So have you ever been in a place where you know things weren't going well, where you're kind of disappointed at how life has turned out, kind of disappointed in yourself, but, but you'd kind of grown comfortable with the kind of mediocrity. You'd kind of come to grips, come to peace with the fact that, well, this is all there is. I think that may have been where the man was. Maybe despite the pain, despite the handicap, maybe you weren't super motivated. Maybe you are not super, super motivated or committed to change. Maybe you've been waiting passively for someone else to do the things for you that you are going to have to do yourself, to make your own decisions, to, to feed and care for yourself. But you're kind of appreciating that other people are worried about you, caring for you, feeding you. Heck, you might even be okay with the fact they're ignoring and discounting you because it's a heck of a lot less pressure. I want to suggest to you that maybe your handicap is a little bit more pernicious than simply that you can't get up and walk. Maybe you're drifting apart from your spouse and you're content to let that happen. Maybe you're getting more and more disenchanted with your life and you're content to let that happen. Maybe you're getting more disinvested in your job and you're like, well, serves them right. I'm not going to give it my all. Maybe you're getting less and less healthy. Maybe you're becoming lazy and self-destructive. Maybe, and this is happening all over America now, maybe you're getting more and more cynical. And that cynicism has turned into bitter name-calling and hostility. Maybe you're becoming more and more materialist. And that's turning into some selfish and uncompassionate way of looking at the world and aggrandizing yourself. In other words, maybe you are a lot like the guy on the mat who whined and complained because nobody was there to help him. And you've grown to like it. I mean, heck, it wouldn't be fair to conclude that this disabled guy liked being handicapped. I don't think that's fair. But I think it is fair to ask whether he wanted the stress and effort of living differently, whether he wanted to go through the hassle of getting better. You know. Even if the man couldn't positively, in positive terms, say that he wanted to get well, what does Jesus do? Jesus makes him better, physically anyway. 
And if you're like me, sometimes you're so used to accepting your limits and your bad habits that it's going to take a sharp knock on the noggin from Jesus for you to even remember that there's the possibility that you could become well. Now, you may not be a physical, physically disabled person. You may not be a lounger or a, a, a slough off or a layabout in your life, but my guess is there's somewhere in your life where you are staying on the floor instead of standing up, where you are wishing or even whining about things not changing instead of making plans and making friends to help you accomplish that. So I, I could say things to you. I mean, pastors do this all the time, and these are not the wrong things. I could tell you to pray more. I could tell you to read your Bible more. I could tell you to discipline yourself more. I could tell you, and I would be all into this, serve and volunteer more. All those things would be fair. But today I simply want to say the same question that Jesus said to the man at the pool. Do you really want to get better? Do you want to get better? Do you want to live a life with more joy, even despite your limitations, than you've had before? Do you want to, do you want to live a life that's got more trust in God's grace than fear about the earth's future? Do you want to live a life that has more impact because you're using your tools and your time and your talent and your treasure to invest in something bigger than your life, even bigger than your family? I say this again, if your children grow up thinking that they're the most important things in your life, that might feel good on a bunch of days, but you know what? When your kids start to have doubts about their own worth, or when they start to wonder, will my parents love me when they find out who I really am? You know what? Your kids are going to want to know that you believe in something more lasting, sovereign, and eternal than them. The question is, do you want to raise their eyes to something that's amazing, something that's holy, something who is God? So for some of you, it's just a blunt question. Do you want these next years to be better than the last ones were? If the answer is yes, then don't settle for a life where on most days you shrug and whine and say, this is as good as it gets, or there's too much against me. There's no point in trying. No, my friends, I challenge you to find a third place, to use today's terminology, Find a place where you can make good friends. Find a place where you can practice being a better friend. And put Jesus in first place in all your places. Home, work, school, and yes, in your church. I am grateful you're part of Caw Prairie. If you've heard a little background noise here, it's because you belong to a church that swings open its doors. For all sorts of community, all sorts of Jesus stuff, all sorts of people. And together with you and with them, we're changing lives with Jesus' love. But to make that last, it all has to begin with letting him change our own. I love you, Caw Prairie. Thanks for being part of this. Next week, it's going to be an amazing service. And I look forward to uh, being part of the confirmation experience. And uh, Pastor Chris will be here with the message. God's peace. Shackles off my feet There's no sound louder than the captive set free Oh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so Sing of His promises evermore Pour out your thankfulness Let it overflow Let the redeemed of the Lord say so There's joy in the morning springing up from my soul There's life worth living Cause He calls me His own There's a hallelujah After sweet victory And there's no sound louder than the captive set free sound louder than the captive set free. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises evermore. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so.
so sing of his promises evermore pour out your thankfulness let it overflow let the redeemed of the lord say 